I haven't been writing for very long. But I love writing. I love the places that writing a book can take you to. Uh, very similar to the places that reading can take you to. But tend to stay there for longer. Um, when I paint, I have to paint in my studio at home. But when I write, I come out onto the hill. And if I'm lucky, it's a sunny day like today. So I thought I'd bring my camera and just show people what one of my offices looks like where I write. This is the hill just up behind my house. It takes about 15 minutes to walk up here. I do walk quite slowly. Quite often the cats come too. Today there's dogs and if you can hear strange gruffling noises, it's not me being eaten by a bear. It's the dogs running around and chewing sticks and digging for beetles and things at my feet. I just pan the camera around. This rock is such an ancient place. There's my shadow. Oh no, it's a yes. Hello. Hi. That's as much as I like to be the other side of the camera. Such an ancient place. There's um, a big standing stone on the gateway up here. And there's walls around it. It used to be a place of sanctuary where if there was a raid people would bring all their animals up here and easily defended because the sides of the rock are so steep and you have a view out right over the peninsula so you can see right down the coast and across to St David's as well if I just take the camera that way I think it's all bleached out by the sun really I need to learn how to control the camera more but it's a beautiful place to write it changes all year round. People say that kisses are only in season when the gorse blooms, but fortunately the gorse is always in bloom. And just at the moment, it's just coming into its heavy scent. So that the air smells like coconuts. And the flowers are rich golden. And I don't know what you can hear on this. I've tried to keep it into the shadow of the wind so that we don't get too much wind noise. It's a very, very still day, and soon the air up here is going to be thick with the sound of skylarks. And there's little wrens hopping around in the bushes. You just catch a flash of brown, and look around, there's a little wren, and they're all staking their claims for their territory, gathering up bits of the moss to make nests. And down in the cove, which is, if I just pan down, down there is where the seal breeding beach is. So in the autumn, about 15 seal pups at any time are on the beach down there. And panning back up a bit. The field system that you can see there is medieval. And this is where I found the first long story that I wrote ever. I used to walk here every day just around to the old village. You can just see there. There's a little lane, carts width wide, and there's some ruined houses. When I first came here, the chimney of our, the biggest house, was still standing. But now it's fallen, it's been pushed over by time and wind and weather and livestock. But these houses were lived in up till Oh, I think it was about 1900, there were still six people living there, all over the age of 60. And the water was drawn from a well, there's no road to it, there's only a path, there's no electricity, there's no water. Um, and there's still, if just down, if you come down through the fields, you can still see the medieval strip fields that are just really, really narrow, where all the fields were divided up for different people just there and one day when I was walking and it was foggy and I could hear the seals singing to their pups on the beach it was like the stones started telling me a story and I started to wonder about the people that lived there and who they were and what had happened to them and one of the things I discovered when researching into it was that the village became a Quaker village 
Um, the Quaker people moved over this side of the hill so that they weren't persecuted by the Christian people on the other side of the hill. And they all wanted to go across to America. Um, and they renamed the road, so the road that led out to their village, the cart track, became the road to Pennsylvania. And the big house became New York Cottage. So I started wondering, you know, how how these people had lived, what had happened. They were all fisher folk, and they, their livelihood was um, as almost as slaves, really. Um, I think the the history of the British working class is well hidden, and um, there was a time when people lived in such a way that it was so harsh. So these cottages weren't owned by the people that lived in them. They were owned by the people that lived in the farms on the other side. And in order to uh, be allowed to live in them, they had to give so many days labor to the farmers on the other side. And this was not just the men, this was the women and it was the children. So you had three, four year old children picking stones out of fields picking vegetables in the harshest conditions when the frost would burn their fingers as they picked. Um, so you can see why the people may have wanted to leave and go across to America to a place where they could own their own houses, farm their own land and hopefully live better lives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the camera away and walk the path down there and go and have a closer look at the ruins before they're gone. So these are the small cottages and walls of Mycemonith. And what I'll do is I'll just walk you around the village a bit. And hopefully we'll get some of the sounds that I can hear. Excuse me while I cough. <coughs> this tree, this great hawthorn tree, will soon be covered in white blossom like a wave that washes over what's left of the house. It must have been planted here by birds. And you can see what remains of the chimney and the gable. When I first moved here 20 years ago, you could stand underneath the lintel of the chimney and look up. But now it's fallen. It's given way to time. Heavy water, wind, weather, and the pushing of cows. The village is called Mysamonith, and I hope my Welsh friends will forgive me my pronunciation. I've never been very good with Welsh words. And I know my friend Rebecca would hit me with a Welsh love spoon if she heard me saying pronunciation like that. And this was the biggest cottage, which was later called New York Cottage. This was the Quaker meeting house, so I'm told. And when I first moved here 20 years ago, the doorway was much clearer defined, the walls were higher, and you could stand beneath the lintel of the chimney, which looked like a, an old piece of ship's timber, and you could look up the chimney. I'm just going into the house now. They would never have had a carpet, I shouldn't think. But now what they have as a carpet is nettles and weeds and lichen-covered grass one chimney place down this end and again when I first moved here this was solid you couldn't see through at all you could just see the the shape with plaster and all this wall was solid and higher and you can see there's a tiny little window up there that would have been like a crog loft where people slept so they would bring the animals into the house at one time and the animals would be kept downstairs and they'd sleep upstairs and go around to here. You've still got the window that's there that looks out onto the Hawthorne. And this was the old chimney that's now fallen. And I'm 
the side of the chimney as a cupboard to keep the dry goods fresh. Looking out, see if it changes. Such a sheltered space, so quiet. So that's one of the houses. This space here, this circle of dark, this was the village well. And then there's some little walls that mark where animal pens stood. And down there, there's a couple more ruins of houses. And it's hard to see. Some of the stone, which was very well worked, stonemason stone, was taken um, to be used in building on the other side of the hill. And some of it is still left. I'll go down and have a look at the other two houses. So, I would walk up here day after day and I would look at this stone and I would think about the people that made the walls the walls that still stand now even though the people are long gone and I used to wonder about the lives of the people who lived in the houses and I used to listen to the buzzards calling overhead and I used to listen to the ravens until one day I started asking more questions and then eventually a story wove itself in my mind beautiful place, I'd love to live here. Like Rolf Harris, can you tell me what it is yet? That's going to be on the film now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Shall yeah. I do a couple just in case I draw yeah. one better? You might have to read. I might edit out the sound. Are you still filming or have you pressed pause? No, I'm pausing. I'm still filming. Alright, are you pointing pause. it in the right? Well, you just press the start button again and then it will stop. And oh, then yeah. you